My name is Lucas Yustik. I am a postdoc currently at EMBL. And to give an overview of my talk for this webinar, I'm going to start with some introduction information to discuss metagenomes, um, why we use metagenomes. I'll then cover the methods of how we create a metagenome and some of the steps that are involved in the data processing. Then the main section will be covering these three main scientific concepts are grouped together. And in this, I'll be also working through case studies that relate to these. And during each of the case studies, I'll have the full citation on the screen the entire time. So if you're interested in reading more, you can find those. And then finally, I'm going to finish with presenting some different resources where you can get metagenomic data, which is publicly available, and some data sets that are already processed. So to give a little bit of background about myself, um, I worked on my PhD in California. I'm originally from the United States in the Martini lab. And in that lab, I worked primarily on ocean metagenomics, doing microbial ecology of phytoplankton. I am now um, across the ocean here in Europe in the Bork lab at EMBL Heidelberg. And I'm currently part of the planetary biology transversal theme as well and working on this concept of planetary microbiology. So studying microbes across the planet, regardless of environment. I'm also part of the Trek project, which is an EMBL led uh, sampling project where they're taking samples all across the European coastlines. I'm not gonna go into detail on this during this presentation, but if you'd like to learn more information about Trek, you can find it uh, at the link on the screen. And so my background is primarily in bioinformatics but I have some sampling experience as I've gone on this trek expedition across Europe. And so I wanted to start with a primer about microbiomes and this idea of a planetary microbiome. And so the first uh, definition of a microbiome was by Wips et al. And it, they called it a characteristic microbial community occupying a reasonably well-defined habitat, which has distinct physiochemical properties. And something I want to point out with this definition is intrinsically in it, they think of environments as somewhat separate and well-defined. And something I want to talk about is within microbial ecology, we have a lot of studies that work on the human side, on human health, the environment, whether it's ocean, soil, or plant-related. Um, but in my experience, the theory and understanding between these different fields does not always overlap. And so something that I think metagenomics provides is potentially a way to bridge many of these gaps and work towards this idea of a planetary microbiome, since none of these systems really work in isolation. And so the first thing I'm going to discuss is the genome sequencing revolution and give some background on to uh, how we got where we are today. And so sequencing progressed quite rapidly. So the structured DNA was first described in the 1960s by Watson and Crick. And then shortly later, we had our first DNA sequencing technology, the Sanger sequencer. Uh, but today, we now have what is termed next generation sequencing. And this term is used because this, these techniques are more cost effective and time effective than Sanger sequencing and also much higher throughput. You can see in this figure the average cost of a human genome to sequence over time. This is from 2001 to 20, uh, 2022. And I want to point out that the y-axis is not linear, it's exponential. So you can see that there has been a steep exponential decrease in the cost of sequencing. What has this resulted in? Well, this has re resulted in um, widespread sequencing. Um, so this figure here is the amount of data stored on NCBI, which is a large repository for sequence data. And you can see, again, the y-axis is uh, exponential. So we've had an exponential growth in uh, sequence data. And to put this into perspective, uh, in 2020, there were roughly 16 petabytes of data on NCBI, which is equal to 16,000 terabytes, if you're familiar with that. So quite a lot of data. And because of this change, there's widespread use of microbial sequencing across different microbial uh, microbiology fields. Uh, it really first started with human health, so sequencing the human gut and skin and human-associated microbes. Uh, 
but there are also many fields studying plant-associated and animal-associated hosts, as well as environmental health, like I mentioned before, in the ocean, soil, aerosols, etc. And one really awesome thing about this is they all use the same techniques of DNA sequencing, meaning this data is all compatible with each other. And so some background on what exactly a metagenome is. A metagenome is a collection of sequences generated from a bulk sample. And some of the advantages to this is it allows us to study communities directly as they are in their environments without isolation. And classically, we had to culture microbes in order to sequence them. Um, there are some difficulties with this. First, you have just the one microbe you're looking for, and it's no longer in a natural environment, right? You've isolated it, whether it's on plates or cell sorting. Um, another downside to this is it's been estimated in a manuscript in 2018 that roughly 20% of Earth's microbes can be cultivated and have been cultivated. So uh, there's a vast majority that cannot be accessed to these more traditional sequencing methods. I want to introduce one more term uh, before I continue on, and this is shotgun versus targeted metagenomics. For most of this presentation, I'll be focusing on shotgun metagenomics, but I also want to introduce you to the other type. And so targeted metagenomics is typically where you do a PCR amplification of sequences. Uh, you might be familiar with 16S, 18S, or I, um, ITS. These are various marker genes. And later in this presentation, I'll discuss what makes a good marker gene. But in this, you're essentially making multiple copies of a gene of interest in order to characterize phylogeny. And so with this, you get compositional data of phylogeny, which kind of microbes are there. And the resolution for 16S is typically around the genus level. And so with this, you'll have different sequencing variants from different hosts, but they're all of the same region that you're amplifying. When we move on to shotgun metagenomics, what you're doing is taking the entire community and randomly fragmenting the DNA. So what this does is results in sequences of all DNA in the sample, um, regardless of where it comes from. And so what this gives you is you have higher accuracy because you have more variable genes, so you can actually uh, tease apart microbes at the strain level and substrain level. You no longer have primer bias because you're not doing any kind of PCR amplification. You're just randomly fragmenting. One other advantage is you can do functional profiling. This is because you are not just sequencing a single marker gene. You're actually sequencing the entire genome. And so you can characterize the functional genes within that. Um, you're also able to create metagenome assembled genomes. And later in the presentation, I'll go into more details on the methods for that. Um, but this gives you an opportunity to characterize the genomes of uh, uncultivated taxa and microbes as they are in their environment without isolation. That being said, there are some caveats. It's not a perfect method. And so this can help you decide if metagenomics is the right technique for a study of interest. First, you have less read depth. So since you are spreading your sequencing across all the different fragments of DNA, as opposed to a single one, each individual gene will have less read depth because you're sharing it over everything. Whereas with a technique like 16S amplicon sequencing, it'll be all 16S. So all of your sequencing depth will go to that. The second caveat, while it can be an advantage, also makes it difficult is this is a meta community. So you can think of all the DNA fragments as little individual puzzles. And since this is the entire community, it's essentially puzzles within puzzles. Each microbe is its own puzzle and you have multiple different microbes. Um, it is also more costly typically to do shotgun metagenomics rather than uh, targeted. And this is because you're doing more sequencing overall, although the cost of this is starting to quite rapidly come down. Also, it requires more computational processing than targeted. With targeted, you have your gene of interest and you typically just need to do some quality controls and you can move right in. Whereas a shotgun metagenomics, you need to put in much more effort to say where a sequence came from, characterize what it is, since it's random fragments. Um, this is common to all metagenomics, but you are only going to get relative abundances of your compositional data. You will not have absolute abundances. For shotgun metagenomics, you also have the issue of host DNA contamination. 
because you are just sequencing any DNA is there, you can actually get sequences from your host. So to move on to some of the methods on how we actually create a metagenome, I first want to walk you through how you prep a sample. The first step is isolating your metagenomic DNA from your sample, whether this is soil or um, feces, water, there'll be different types of sample prep kits. And as I said, you'll have often contaminant DNA. You can also have sample preparation kits, which help to reduce the amount of contaminant DNA in your sample. Once you have your DNA isolated, you then would run it through a sequencer, which will get you your actual sequences. And then before you can do any formal analysis, there is some quality control and post-processing that you need to do on your sequences. And there are two main types of uh, high throughput next generation sequencing. The first is short read sequencers and the second is long read sequencers. There are advantages and disadvantages to each. For most of this presentation, I'll be focusing on short read sequencing because currently this is the most common, uh, most prevalent type of sequencing. Um, for short read sequencing, some of the areas it's strongest in is quantifying um, the abundances of genes or microbes, as well as detecting single nucleotide polymorphisms. Whereas long read sequencers are better for genome assembly because you have longer sequences to overlap and connect and detecting structural, st structural variations. One downside to long read sequencing is they're typically much less accurate than short reads, um, except there are some new versions of PacBio that get around this, but they're much more costly than other techniques of DNA sequencing. And like I said, I'll be focusing on short read sequencing for the majority of this talk. And I'm gonna quickly walk through the chemistry of how you actually do short read sequencing with Illumina. And so the first step is a library preparation where you again, randomly fragment the DNA from whatever your sample is. And at this step, you need to attach adapters onto your sequences. The reason for this is these adapters allow your sequence to connect to a flow cell where you'll do the actual sequencing. Once they have connected, it will go through multiple bridge amplification cycles, which essentially creates multiple copies of your DNA se sequence, forming these clusters of the same sequence all together. The reason why you want multiple sequences all grouped together is the way you actually get your sequence from the DNA sequencer is by measuring light. So they have DNA base pairs, which are attached with different fluorophores. And what you're doing is adding on new base pairs. A can only ever attach to T, C and G are also pairs. And so what this does is each cycle, as you add a new nucleotide, you'll get a light signal for the corresponding base. And these clusters are all the same sequence. So in theory, they should all shine the same color, giving you a stronger signal. For Illumina, this is highly parallel. So there are many, many sequences that are all being measured for each cycle. When it comes off the sequencer, you still need to do some quality control. For example, if that light signal is not easily readable, you might have low quality nucleotide reads where you're not very confident on which letter it was. You also need to remove your adapter sequences um, as well as any contamination. And there are many tools out there that will do this. And a common way to remove contamination is to align your sequences to the host genome. So say you have a human stool sample, you can align your sequences to a human reference genome in order to reduce any human DNA that is still in that sample. And so with that background now, I'm going to move into the main scientific concepts and tools that we use to characterize metagenomes. And so I grouped this into three overarching concepts, and these are very broad, but I'll give case studies on exactly how they're used. And I want to mention that while I here present them separately, in actual studies, they're not separate, right? They're used in conjunction very often. And the first is microbial composition. This is who is in your sample comparing uh, different relative abundances. The second main concept is functional annotations and functional potential. So looking at the different types of genes there and their actual function and what this can tell you about um, an environment or host. And then also information we can get from metagenome assembled genomes. 
where we take all these fragmented reads and assemble them into representative genomes. And so the first concept is composition. Who is there? In this, you are really comparing differences in community membership. So right here I have, this represents, you know, two different samples. And between them, it changes what microbes are present. And so how would you actually characterize this in a metagenome? The typical way is, and the current best practice is to map your reads to a set of marker genes. And right after this, I'll describe what makes a good marker gene. But you have all of your fragmented metagenomic reads, and then you would have reference sequences from your marker gene um, and different references for the microbes you are interested in. And what you do is you map these reads onto your reference to get the relative abundance. So in this case, there's an equal amount of reads um, for each microbe's marker gene. So your relative abundance would be split between the two. Whereas in another case, if you have more of one of the species, then you have a higher relative abundance. Um, with this, it's either read counts or you can also do read coverage. But what makes a good marker gene? Some you might be familiar with is 16S, 18S, ITS that we use in Amplicon sequencing. Those are marker genes. Um, there are also other options, since in metagenomics, you can use any marker gene. Um, and the main two things you want is you want them to be first a single copy gene, and then also a core gene. And I'm going to walk through these two examples to show why. Um, in this example, the top is a single copy gene, so only one copy per genome, whereas the bottom gene for this red microbe is multi-copy. So in this case, both microbes are in equal relative abundance. But since this gene is a multi-copy, it will have more sequences sequenced, so it'll look like it's in higher abundance. So when selecting your marker gene, you want it to be something that is single copy across uh, the microbes that it is within. The second thing you need is for this to be a core gene. What a core gene means is it's a gene required for this organism to be alive. In this example now, the top shows a gene that is a flexible gene, one that is not a core gene, versus the bottom is a core gene. So say you are using a gene that is a non-core gene, and only half the population actually has that gene. While in the sample, there is twice as much of this red microbe as the blue, it will only show up equal. So the relative ones will look the same because half of them will not have this gene. Whereas if it's an actual core gene that they all must have, you'll get the accurate relative abundance. And some examples of how you can use this. Um, one very clear one is detecting disease in the human gut. And I have some examples we'll go over. In this manuscript, they looked at um, fecal metagenomes and showed that there are certain microbes that were indicative of colorectal cancer. So in this figure, here in green is the controls, red is the individuals with colorectal cancer, and blue is for IBD patients. The axis here is the relative abundance between them with low values being at the left and high values on the right. And what I wanna point out is for these four different microbes here, they're all significantly, significantly enriched in individuals who have colorectal cancer versus the controls and the IBD patients. And so in this paper, what they proposed was using the presence of these microbes as a diagnostic for early stage colorectal cancer. One limitation with this is you're getting composition data, which is relative abundance. And so here on the left, we have an example between two samples, um, the condition one and condition two. And in reality, this could look two different ways. Uh, you could have in condition two, like it shows here in scenario one, where there is more of B overall, while A stays the same. So when you go to the relative amounts compared to each other, you'll get this. But there could also be a different pattern where B stays constant and A actually reduces, which is what causes this shift. And there are ways to um, experimentally test absolute abundances, such as cell sorting, counting, et cetera. Um, but this is not done typically just based on uh, composition sequences. There is a tool that was made by a colleague in my current lab, um, and it is called microbial load, microbial load predictor. And what this actually can do is based on your compositional data in the human gut in particular, 
um, it can actually predict what the actual counts are of these in individual cells. So what he did was he took data sets where they had cell counts as well as the compositional data and trained a machine learning model, which was able to capture these patterns and predict the absolute abundances. In the case of colorectal cancer, there are certain microbes that we saw where the relative abundance was indicative, but there are other systems where it's more important to see the absolute counts in order um, to make these predictions. So I want to move on to the second concept, which is functional potential and functional genes. So what this is looking at is what is the difference in actual genes in that environment? So before it was more so community membership, whereas this is a difference in genes. And some of the things that this can help with is it can be used as a biosensor for ecosystem or community state. And it can also show you the functional potential of the microbes. So this little diagram here is just representing that between populations, you'll have different genes with different functions, and we can characterize that with metagenomes. And so the techniques for this is you, again, map your reads to an annotated reference, similar to the compositional data, um, or you can do it to an entire pathway, but the genes you select are different. So say you are interested in a gene which codes for a membrane transporter for uptake of phosphate, you can find reference sequences of this protein and actually map your metagenomic reads or use HMM models. There's many different ways to do this, um, but quantify how much of this gene is in your uh, sample. You can do the same for other genes if you're interested. Say you're interested in nitrogen fixation, which is taking atmospheric nitrogen and making it into a more bioavailable form. You can find references for these sequences within your samples and again, map the reads. And with this, you can compare how different functional genes vary in, uh, in comparison to each other. And I'm going to give a case study that used this concept. This was from my PhD. And um, in this project, we use metagenomic data to characterize global patterns of ocean nutrient limitation. And to give some quick background on why we're interested in nutrient limitation, what that is, in this project, we're studying picophytoplankton, which are essentially microscopic bacteria which photosynthesize similar to plants. So you can think of them as you know tiny plants in the ocean. And similar to plants, they need three things to grow and survive. The first is sunlight, the second is water, and the third is various nutrients. And since they're in the surface ocean where we looked, they get plenty of sunshine. Since they're in the ocean, they have access to plenty of water. So the main thing that typically limits their growth, how much they can photosynthesize and how much carbon they can fix is nutrients. So in this project, we're interested in characterizing the global patterns of nutrient limitations since it has really strong impacts on climate cycles. And so the way we actually did this was we took our metagenomic data and applied this concept. And so you have the global Pleurococcus pangenome and what pangenome means is just all the different genes within a population. So in this case, Plecorococcus is the phytoplankton we are looking at in particular, and the pangenome is all of the different genes of Plecorococcus across all our samples. Within the pangenome, you have different types of functional genes. So you could have ones that are adaptations to low nitrogen conditions that give you new access to sources, or you could have membrane transporters like I showed in the previous example for phosphorus. And so when you are in a situation where you're actually nitrogen limited, you'll have selection for the microbes who have these adaptations to low nitrogen conditions. So what this does is if you go into the actual sequencing data, you'll see an enrichment of these nitrogen genes within your population. And it's the same concept for phosphorus limitation, their selection, these genes become more abundant, and then also for iron. One other thing that we used in this study was core genes. So we quantified the abundance of Pleurococcus core genes to norm normalize based on population size. Again, like we said with sequence data, it's all relative to something. So here we normalize by core gene count to get roughly how many counts of this gene of interest are there per individual in the population. And so the results for this is it gave us a global map of the variation in nutrient limitation type and severity. And you can see in the Northern Atlantic, we see phosphorus and nitrogen co-limitation, which was to be expected, as well as iron limitation in the equatorial upwellings of the Pacific. 
But with this study, we also found many novel patterns. So for example, the Indian Ocean hadn't been characterized. And so these are all novel patterns that are very important for informing climate models. Now, the last broad concept I'm going to cover is metagenome assembled genomes, MAGs. And what this does over more classic genomes is it can give you access to novel organisms. It doesn't require isolation. Um, one thing that's worth mentioning is metagenomes are fragmented. I'll go into some details on the methods of why this is. So they're typically lower quality than isolate genomes. Um, but additionally, you can then combine the gene functional annotations and phylogenetic annotations with location on the genome information, which can help inform you about things such as gene function and other ecological or biologically relevant principles. Um, yes. So how do you actually assemble a mag? You start with all your fragmented reads, which are from everything in your sample. And the first step is an assembly. And here I'm showing a de novo assembly. So what you do is the sequences have overlap where there's regions that they're the same. And you take all these short sequences, overlap them to make larger continuous sequences. And what this does is it gives you larger assembled contigs. So these are just longer, more continuous sequences. The next step is binning because now you have longer sequences, but you're not sure which of these longer sequences are from the same genomes or not. And so there's different ways of checking, such as KMER frequencies and also uh, how they co-occur or not in samples. Um, but what you can do is bin these different sequences together and say, I think all these different large fragments are from the same host genome. Then the last step is to do quality control. And the two things that are classically checked for is completeness, you know, how complete is the genome and how much contamination is there. You could have a case where you incorrectly bend and there are certain sections that clearly look like they're from different organisms. Um, and so it's very important to do QC on mags before diving too much into analysis. And now to give you a case study of how they applied this, um, in this manuscript, they characterize the function and also just conserved unknown genes. And one of the big perks of a, a metagenomes is you can dive into these uncultivated and uncharacterized individuals. Uh, with these other previous studies I talked about, this is very reliant on existing gene annotations, right? You need um, annotated references in order to imply those functions or imply that phylogeny. Um, but based on genome context information, you can actually infer functions. So say here you have this gene in gray, which has an unknown function. If you find that same gene in multiple other genomes surrounded by the same other genes, you can imply its function. And this is because within prokaryotes, their genes group together into operons when they all have a common functionality. So say you are surrounded in multiple genomes, this structure is conserved. It is very likely that your unknown gene has a function within the same pathway. In this paper, they did this across many, many metagenomes. And here in gray are all these different unknown genes that were conserved within these well-characterized pathways. Right here, they look at nitrogen fixation, and this gene was conserved there, as well as denitrification <clears throat> and nitrification. And so what they showed was many of these unknown genes play parts in really important steps in nitrogen cycling within our climate. So you could also have a situation where you have genes from unknown taxa, you, you know, they're uncultivated, they haven't been characterized in the lab, as well as groupings of genes where we don't know the function of any of them. What you can still look for is conserved genomic context where these genes still co-occur all together nearby across multiple different genomes. And while you can't directly infer their function, since you don't have other information to char uh, characterize it with, you can infer that they have a conserved uh, role together and that these aren't due to random mutations or different things, that this is a conserved gene grouping. In this manuscript, they did this. And right here, these are all novel gene families that were based on conservation and unknown taxa with unknown function. And they compared it again to colorectal cancer. And they found there are many that had really strong negative associations with uh, colorectal cancer. And there were many with positive associations. And in this manuscript, they actually uh, 
showed that through these functional um, annotations, you can get more accurate predictions of CRC. And this is to show that just because we don't have annotations for these genes or know their function, they can still be useful in uh, characterizing microbiomes. And so a quick summary of what we talked about, composition, who is there, functional potential, what the genes do, and then MAGS, which gives you genome structure. Again, these are not separate concepts. These three papers that I highlighted really uh, drill into one and leverage one. But in many ecology and human-related studies, you are looking at a wide range of these things. They're not exclusive to each other, I want to point out. And so now I want to talk about some publicly available resources where you can find metagenomic data. As I said at the beginning, um, the amount of publicly available metagenomic data has been just growing exponentially and continues to do so. And one of the main places you can find this is at repositories from the International Nucleotide Sequencing Database Collaboration. These are the three main databases that are all synced together that have uh, nucleotide data, including metagenomic data. Um, and these databases are synced. So um, it doesn't matter too much which you access, it's more which is spatially closer to you because you'll actually get different download speeds depending on your diff uh, distance from these databases. And this is all um, raw sequence data typically, but there are also data sets that are curated and already processed with metagenomic data. And so one that was recently published from the lab I am in, the Bork lab by Schmidt et al. Um, was a collection of over 100,000 metagenomes. And these metagenomes came from all sorts of different environments, whether it's uh, human gut, soil, aerosols, aquatic, um, plant associated, animal associated. Uh, these, they had ones from uh, wastewater treatment plants, anything that they could find metagenomic data wise. Um, with this, they assembled all of these samples, which resulted in over a million medium to high quality mags. And so this already went through that entire assembly pipeline that I showed. Additionally, for all 100,000 100, of these samples, they already uh, quantified the composition using the MOTUs pipeline. So this is also readily available if you're interested in compositional data. And with these mags, they have all been annotated. So you have those that genome structure as well as functional annotations. And one thing that's really nice and unique to this study is they manually created environmental descriptions of each sample, which they termed uh, microontology. And so for each of these metagenomes, they can be grouped at various levels on whether, you know, aquatic versus terrestrial, or you want to drill in more to aquatic, you know, there's surface versus extreme environments, so on and so forth. And so it can also be a really nice way if you're looking for metagenomic data, you can scan through the samples based on this microontology and it gives you the IDs to get the raw sequence data, as well as all these downstream products. Um, there's also another data set from our lab called ProGenomes from Fulham et al. And this, as opposed to being, envir uh, being metagenome assembled genomes, these are more high quality genomes, so more isolate genomes, single cell, um, which you can be more confident in. And so while this doesn't give you the look straight into the environment as a metagenome does, what this reference is great for is if you want high quality reference sequences to contextualize your annotations by, um, you can get those references from this data set. Also, I want to suggest some tools for each of these steps. This is all for short read sequencing. And I wanna say this is not by any means a um, exhaustive list. These are just tools that I'm personally familiar with that I've used for these different steps. And I'm not going to go into detail on any of these in particular because the slides will be available um, after this presentation. So if you are interested in any of these tools, I would encourage you to look them up. But it goes through all the major steps from quality control of raw reads. If you're interested in composition, who is there? There's different pipelines. Mapping tools so you can pair, connect to the reads to whatever reference you're interested in yourself as well as different tools for going through the entire pipeline of creating mags. And um, before we wrap up, I want to come back to like the original concept that I talked about towards this planetary microbiome. And in our different fields, whether it's environmental, human, et cetera, microbiology, I think that it's really important to start having uh, many crosstalks between this. 
and this is often difficult, but one advantage of omics data in particular metagenomics is, right, the language is the same. DNA sequences for microbes are the same. And so I think this is a really nice um, opportunity, and especially as we have more and more of this data, to work on studies and form questions that bridge the gaps between these different environments and get us a more holistic view of microbiomes across the globe. And before we do questions, I also want to do some acknowledgements. I first want to thank the whole BORT group. Um, they give me a lot of feedback on this presentation. In particular, I'd like to thank everyone on the left. Um, they attended many practice talks helping me to polish this, so I really appreciate all the feedback they gave me and guidance as well as suggestions on case studies, which nicely illustrated these points. And do we have any questions? So let me... Thank you. Yeah, thanks a lot, Lucas, for today's webinar. Very wonderful. It's great that you described the concepts and highlighted the important and useful resources and also highlighted some useful data sets. Uh, so yeah, and thanks, everyone, for joining in today. Uh, we already have quite a good number of questions in our Q&A bank. So I'll start with the uh, first question. Is there an online repository to identify single copy or core genes? There are different ones. The one that I know off the top of my head is the MOTUs. Um, I cited it before. It's used to get this compositional data. Um, but for this, they use a set of, I believe, 10 core genes now that they've selected because they are single copy. They are brought across the tree of life. And so in uh, the MOTUs pipeline, they have sequences that they use. And there are also other resources. Um, I just don't know the names off the top of my head, but yeah, there are, people have really thought about this for quite a while. So there are some really nicely collected uh, collections of genes. Thank you. Uh, next question I'm just trying to interpret uh, uh, myself is, is there a way to get quantification from metagenomics data in the same way as you quantify uh, qPCR data? Um... If you're referring to uh, getting towards the absolute abundances or amount of starting DNA that you would get from like qPCR, the real time, uh, no, you cannot. To my knowledge, there might be some really cutting edge stuff that does that, but um, to my knowledge, you cannot. But you can still get sequence data. So if it's you know the sequence variants you're interested in, you can get that from metagenomic. If it's the real time Q part of qPCR. Um, I'm not familiar with any, you know, Q metagenomes. How can you map uh, pathways in the metagenome, uh, probably from metagenomics analysis? Yeah, so a, I can go back to the slide, but it's very similar to how you do it for individual genes. Um, but instead of looking at one gene, you can look at multiple genes involved in a pathway. Um, so say you're interested in nitrogen fixation, you can look at multiple genes for different parts of the nitrogen nitrogenase subunit, whether it's NIF H, D, K, so on and so forth. And then also there are the KEG pathways, K-E-E-G, or K-E-G-G. -G. <laughs> um, and here it's a really nice curated data set of different known pathways and genes that confer for that. So in this public resource, you can actually go there and say you have a microbial pathway that you're really interested in. You can see what already exists and what's been characterized. Um, and so it's not limited to, to one gene. You know, in this example, I just showed two genes, um, but there will be multiple genes for different pathways or like I said, in this operon grouping structure. And so you can get to entire pathways at looking at different genes that cover different parts of this. Thank you. Is microbial load predictor only applicable to human gut data or can it also be applied to mammalian gut data? As of now, it is only human gut data because the way the model was trained is on cell counts from human gut to then predict human gut. Um, there are some people looking at applying this to the environment because you have cell count data sets in the environment, but um, as of now, microbial load predictor is a human gut only tool. Yeah. Uh, so in metagenomics, is is RNA sequencing also done, or is only DNA sequencing? Yes, I didn't touch on it to here, but yes, we, there is shotgun tra transcriptomics as well. So you can do shotgun RNA sequencing. Thank you. 
How much uh, does metagenome analysis and MAG techniques rely on reference genomes and known functional genes? Are they used to discover new polymorphism and contigs? Yes. Um, so the last example is a nice example where they um, start predicting new genes that don't have any annotations that are from unknown organisms here. Um, for a lot of metagenomic studies, it does rely on known references. On the compositional side as well, for who is there, there are some steps taken where now, um, for example, in the MOTUs tool, which quantifies composition, they're actually looking into metagenomes at sequences that are from these genes, but unannotate, unannotated and clustering those together. And so with that, you can still capture un, uncharacterized microbes based on their sequences. So you can't say who they are or like what exactly their phenotype is. When you make mags, you can work towards characterizing that. Um, but that is a big step of trying to get at this uncultivated or dark matter. Um, how can we computationally characterize these unknown things? Um, and so that's a big step in uh, current area of research for metagenomics. Thank you. If MAG sequence of certain species is not generated in most of the samples, even though their abundance is generally high, according to profiling results, uh, for example, metaflan, is there a way uh, to overcome this? Uh, and what's the reason that MAGs are not generated despite their high abundance? Yes, <clears throat> so MAGs, have different things which makes it hard to assemble. Um, for example, in the ocean, Plocorococcus, that microbe I talked about, is highly abundant in most of the equatorial ocean. But its issue is it has a lot of really fine scale diversity, termed microdiversity. So this assembly is trying to connect and overlap all these sequences. So um, for example, this is one case which will hurt assembly, is if you have a lot of really se similar sequences, it can't differentiate like uh, how they connect, if that makes sense. So you start getting many branches in the assembly graph. You can imagine, you know, it's a sequence that continues. And at one point, there's all this branching microdiversity. And so it splits off in all these different ways and it can't resolve it. Um, repeats also make this really difficult. Say you have a whole bunch of repeats in your organism and there are repeat regions that are common across species. Once it hits that repeat region, it doesn't know how many repeats there are. And if this is a repeat motif that's in multiple species, it can't connect them. Um, so all that to say, there's a lot of different reasons why a mag might not assemble, even though it's highly abundant, um, because there's different assembly biases. So I couldn't tell you, you know, which it is in particular. Um, but yes, that is common to happen that something doesn't assemble well. All right. Uh, so next question is, when you are doing statistical inference for differential enrichment of MAGs or genes in a metagenome, how do you quantify a significant enrichment while accounting for sample compositionality? Yeah, so it's, it depends on how you're getting to your, your end data. Is So it's kind of, a, it's tough to answer because each situation is quite different. Um, for example, for a gene, the one I did in my case, uh, where I showed in the ocean, these are all normal by normalized by single copy core gene counts. And I had the same number of samples for each in that normalization step. So you could compare um, between them, where it goes up, where it goes down, what type of statistics. If you want to account for that composition directly, it, it really depends. So in that case, we got around composition by normalizing by a single copy core gene count. Um, but it's, it's still composition data. So I haven't done too much tying that in directly. You're usually working with relative abundances and there's statistical tests that are made to compare relative abundances. Um, so it might not be the most satisfying answer, but I guess it's tough because the data is all very different. And depending on how you get that composition in the end will really change what kind of statistical test you need to do. Thank you. Is there any way we can distinguish a uh, plasmid in MAG sequence? Because MAG itself is incomplete genome, there could be many contexts that can be incomplete genome 
or possible plasmid? Yes. Um, I'm not an expert on this, but I know people who are currently working on this kind of thing. One of the very simple ways to do that is if you have a circular sequence that's about the size of a plasmid, um, it might be a plasmid, not a fragment of a, meta a metagenome. I know there are also uh, different genes for creating the machinery to conjugate a plasmid, which if you detect all of those in a fragment, as well as say it ends up being circle circular, there are ways to infer that's a plasmid. Thanks. Uh, the next question is uh, on the similar note, how to avoid host DNA contamination? So, I mean, it starts all the way at the experiment, right? At the very beginning, uh, depending on how you're sampling, you want to avoid contamination. Um, there are sample prep kits, which are made to try and just release, you know, the microbial DNA. They will have reagents that don't, you know, lice eukaryotic cells as well, for example, um, just prokaryotic membranes. And then on the computational side, which is what I have more experience with, it, it really depends. So it typically comes from comparing to a reference of what you expect your host to be. So say it's in plants, if you have sequence genomes of that plant, it's good to screen your reads past that to make sure that none of them are clearly from it. Um, and as well as there's other references, whether, you know, if you want to remove viral DNA, you can do the same. Um, can I infer microbial function from the targeted metagenomics? Yes, sort of. <laughs> um, so there are tools where they take the sequences of those marker genes and they compare it to known genomes and the functional genes within them. And then it does guesswork to try and say, you know, if you have X amount of one sequence, you probably have this much of another functional gene. I believe it's called pie crust. I would double check that because I'm notoriously bad with acronyms. And as you've seen in this presentation, there's a lot of acronyms in bioinformatics. Um, but so there's a big asterisk there that it's guessing. Um, so you can get a good guess, but um, it's inferring what is there based on it. So yeah, yes with a big asterisk. All right, uh, since 16S is not single copy, it does not uh, meet criteria. Why is it used that widely and what marker gene do you suggest instead? Yes, um, the short answer is because it was one of the first genes. And so it has kind of that founder's effect and adoption. It's been widely adopted. Um, as you mentioned, now it's been shown that it's not necessarily a single copy. There's organisms with multiple copies. Um, so yes, you're correct. And that's just because it's historically been used. It was the first you know, universal marker gene for prokaryotes. Um, as far as specific genes you can use instead, um, I've used in the ocean, the RPOC1 gene, which is a part of a ribosomal subunit. It has uh, more flexibility so you can get higher resolution. Um, I don't know exactly how generalizable it is as far as bacteria to archaea, other prokaryotes. Um, but also, like I said, with the, the MOTUS pipeline, the MOTUs, they've selected 10 genes that have, as you've characterized more genomes, um, still are highly single copy and are across multiple different organisms. So my suggestion would be to check those genes. I don't know them by name, um, but yeah. I think... Uh... Question on a similar note. Thank you for a wonderful presentation. My question is, is there a gold standard method for enrichment steps prior to library preparation and sequencing? Um, depending on your environment, maybe. Um, I am a bit more of a bioinformatician, so I've done a little bit of sampling, but as far as the library preparation kits, um, I don't know which are necessarily the best. I, like I said, for different environments, they have different kits, which should help you amplify your DNA. So I would check in the literature, you know, um, with this, it's all publicly available. Um, but no, I don't know if there's one that's best. And I think it's also very environment slash sample specific. Looking at the tools you listed, are these tools specific 
to specific platforms or they can also be used for pack bio um most of the tools that i showed at the end are specific to short reads so illumina sequencing some of them are generalizable such as you know the annotation tools i don't think once you've made your mags it matters but for the assembly and bending steps, those are specific tools to Illumina. Some of them may have long read versions, um, but all of them I showed, I know work for short reads. Some might be applicable for long reads, but I didn't check. Thanks for the talk. What is your opinion, experience comparing gamer based methods such as Kraken or Centrifuge to mapping-based methods such as Metaflan? in terms of specificity, sensitivity, et cetera? So I haven't formally compared them, but my understanding is mapping is typically more accurate, but more computationally expensive. I don't, I haven't formally checked this um, and I don't have a good example to say that. Uh, so this could be incorrect, but that is my understanding that typically mapping is more accurate. Okay, how different are the three general databases, Japan, the European community, uh, and GenBank. As far as their nucleotide sequence data, um, it's the same. The metadata might be stored slightly differently, um, but I highlighted those three databases because they are part of the, I forget the acronym name, the INSDC, which essentially syncs all these to each other and standardizes it. So while there might be, you know, little differences on their front end, how their website works and how you might download them, the data should be the same across the three. Uh, we have three more minutes left. Uh, we have quite a few questions to go through. So I have sorted them out now in terms of likes. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. For uh, freshman in metagenomics analysis for shotgun sequencing. Could you advise any useful sources, courses, or workshops to advance the knowledge in metagenomics analysis? Yes. I mean, I have used many over the course of my career. As far as telling you the specific names of these workshops, I don't know off the top of my head, but you can find a lot of this just uh, on YouTube, for example. Like during my PhD, I self-taught mags just by Googling how to do mags, um, you know, mag assembly pipelines. And so I would recommend whatever you're really interested in, check Google um, as well as EBI. I know we have many workshops, some here uh, might also be applicable, but I think also the EBI stuff is quite searchable. So I don't know names off the top of my head. I can vaguely remember the types of things, but I would say, uh, yeah, searching YouTube and Google, you'll find lots of different public resources. Yeah, I can also add that we do run uh, a genome bioinformatics course, which is mainly run by the Magnify team. So they do focus a lot on metagenomic analysis. Yeah. So please look for that. Okay, to what extent are metagenomic studies reproducible between different laboratories? Or are the results highly dependent on the data analysis? Um. That's a tough one to answer, but I can give you examples from my own work. Um, so with what we're doing um, with this one study with 100,000 metagenomes across the globe, since we processed it all ourselves, um, obviously the experimental side, we did not but the computational side, they are actually quite comparable. Also during my PhD, I used three major ocean surveys. One was produced by our lab, BioGoship, then there was Tara Oceans and BioGeotraces. And all three of them use different techniques, different sequencing depths. Um, but if you process your data all the same and you um, normalize it in a way that uh, accounts for many of the potential biases, they can all overlap. In that case, I didn't have any batch effects between the, the three major surveys. Yeah. Thanks, Lucas. Uh, it's already half past four, but we have quite a few questions, but probably we can take just one more Okay. Uh, to, to end the webinar. Is it important to use any cutoff for the processed metagenomics data to eliminate the bacteria with low abundance from the analysis? Yes. Um, yes. So it is very common to use cutoffs for 
your microbes, whether it's compositional data, right? You remove OTUs below a certain count. Um, if it's a gene of interest, um, or say you're looking at a specific microbe, you might only use samples that have a minimum of a certain amount of coverage. What that number is, is really dependent. Um, you know, in the ocean, I was doing Pleurococcus and I did, I would only analyze a metagenome if it had at least, uh, you know, five sequences average depth across Pleurococcus genomes. Otherwise I'd say, you know, there's not enough sequences there to be reliable. Uh, so how exactly you make that cutoff and what that cutoff is, is again, very specific to what you're doing. Um, but yes, it's really encouraged to have these thresholds. Um, and usually a, a way you can look at it is look at adjusting that threshold, see if there's weird patterns that disappear or appear as you go through it. Um, Cause that might be examples of things are contamination or sequencing errors or something. So thank you again. Thanks Lucas. And thanks everyone. Yeah. Thank Bye. you for having me. Thank you.